we're going to move to static equilibrium and elasticity. Um, so let's start with the first part of that, equilibrium. Equilibrium means that something is, uh, it, there may be um, things going on, in this case forces and torques, but the situation is not, the, the system is not changing overall. So when we consider, uh, when we consider static equilibrium, we're mostly talking about cases where there is a, there are forces and there are torques, but there is no net force and there is no net torque. Um, so you will have, in many of these cases, um, because forces are a little easier to understand and, uh, and we've already done some work with them. Most of the cases that we're going to consider have torques, and you're, and you're considering torques that either act, um, one, there will usually be two torques or multiple torques. Some of them uh, cause rotations which are clockwise, and some of them cause rotations which are counterclockwise, and they both cancel out. Um, and so here is an example. If you consider the load in a truck, um, you can have at the center of mass, now, so if the truck is stable, you have uh, a normal force from one wheel and a normal force from the other. So if we draw an upright truck, and there's a reason I'm a physicist and not an artist, if your center of mass is between the two wheels, then there's a normal force on each wheel, um, and even if it's tilting ever so slightly, the normal force, um, or even if it's if one wheel is off the ground, as long as the um, the center of mass is not over the wheel, then you end up with no net rotation. However, if you have the truck at an angle, as soon as your center of mass is over that wheel, then you have a point of contact. You have a net rotation, you will ha you'd have your normal force here, except that the normal force causes no torque because there's no, um, because it's not, there's no moment arm between the um, axis of rotation and the normal force. So gravity causes a rotation um, a about the, the wheel, where the wheel is itself the axis. Um, so this is an example where you can have a static equilibrium, where if you are just barely at that point, um, you have um, you have a system which is stable. And we're coming back to um, to our concept of the center of mass, because in most cases you can treat an extended object as if it is a point particle located at its center of mass. Um, or center of gravity. So here you have an, another example. We'll work through this one. Um, I'm going to draw an axis here. So we will draw X here, or we'll draw Y here. Our X will go like this. And here we have uh, the negative X direction. And I'm drawing this, and you're seeing the mirror image. So if it Looks like my x's are always positive to the left instead of the right. That's why um, I try to flip it on the fly when we're talking about cross products. Um, but please be a little forgiving if the video actually shows something slightly off. All right, so now we have to go back to what is our equation for the center of mass. Um, we'll actually just consider the x direction because we're not given any information about y. and that is the um, 1 over the mass times the sum of the masses of each part times the position of each part. So here, um, our, we're given the weight, which is equal to the mass times gravity. Um, so the total weight is going to be, um, is going to be, the weight over the gravitation, the total mass is the weight over the gravitational constant. And then here um, we have the position of the first wheel is at zero. So I chose my axes so that I had zeros. There's a lot of cases in physics where you have arbitrary choices to make, and you often want to choose to set something equal to zero because it makes the math easier. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. 
Okay, so for that first one, we have 0 times 0.48, and now I'm supposed to multiply by the mass. It's the weight over G, and then plus 2.5 meters, and this should be 0 meters, times 0.52 weight over G. All right, so this term goes to zero. These guys cancel out. And I am left with 2.5 times 0 0.52, 2.5 meters times 0.52. And this is 1.25 plus 0.05 or 1.3 meters. So my center of mass is not at the geometric center in this case. So if this is 1.25, the geometric center, my center of mass is actually slightly over at 1.3 meters because I have a little bit more weight towards the front end of the car. So you're going to have to refresh yourself on the center of gravity or center of, uh, center of mass. Um, this is typical of physics that you, you don't get to forget the stuff that you learned earlier. You need to build on it. All right. So here you have, this is a different way of setting it up. Yeah, you can view it as a torque, a problem with torques about the center of mass. Um, and the, the, the car could be rotating about the center of mass, but you're looking for net zero torque. Of course, you also have the normal force, um, which is applying, uh, which, which is counteracting the weights in that case. All right, you also could do the same problem. Instead of choosing the pivot point to be about the center of mass, choose the pivot point to be somewhere else. And when you consider the problem that way, you still end up with no net torque. So when you are doing these problems where you're considering net torque, you get to choose where to draw the pivot point because no matter where you draw it, there's no net torque. Choose wisely, young grasshopper. You want to choose something where the, um, where the net, where, where you get a lot of zeros so you don't have to do as much math. I love math, but I don't like doing it just for fun. Well, okay, I, I, I do, but I'm weird. Um, you're here, so you're probably, you probably do like doing math for fun, too. Okay, so here, now um, when you think about how you're going to draw this, okay, we are, we're going to do our coordinate system, x, y, and now we're going to think about the um, the net forces on this point right here. So we can draw our free body diagram. And you have one tension, which is like this. We will call this tension one. You have one tension, which is like this. This is tension two. And then you have the weight. And I have not drawn this to scale because the weight actually has to counteract both tensions. And that still isn't quite to scale, but close enough. Um, all right, and now we have, we are given, so this is 90 degrees, so we actually can get the angles, um, but I'm going to, leave them as, let's see, if we, if we do this, this is theta, um, and then this guy is 90 minus theta. Um, so then we can write down our, so it says mass is gradually added to the pan until one of the strings snaps. So in this case, what if you are asked, well, the, the question is, what is the tension in the string? So um, 
and you can solve for the tensions in both strings. We'll set it up, but I don't, there's enough problems in this chapter that I'm not going to go all the way through because um, we'll do some examples near the end. So we, we start out by writing our tension. We can write tension 1 in terms of our x components and y components. So tension 1 is, let's see, if this is... This guy should also be 90 minus theta. I'm going to leave the trig ugly. Um, so this is, or I could actually say that this is theta. Um, so if that's theta, then I have the magnet T1 is the magnitude of T1 um, sine theta x hat plus the magnitude of T1 cosine theta y hat. And both of those are in the positive x and y direction. T2 is... The magnitude of T2 cosine theta, it's in the negative x direction, x hat plus T2 uh, let's see, sorry, cosine theta is going to, uh, this one needs to be sine theta. And this one is cosine theta, y hat. And then I have weight, which is the magnitude of weight in the negative y hat direction. All right, now I can write up, um, I can write my net force. I have two equations here because I have the net force in the x direction and I have the net force in the y direction. The x direction is actually easier. The net force in the x direction is T1 sine theta minus T2 sine theta. Double check those sines and cosine. This one is cosine in the y direction, sine in the x direction, and Ah, no, I have them flipped here because the angle is not here, it's there. I had it right the first time. And let's do a cross check. If we make theta equals zero, all of my T2 should be in the X direction. Good. That's what I want. Okay, so from this I get that T1, that I, can, I can rearrange this and get T2 equals T1 tangent of theta. And then my net, so now I can eliminate T2 from these equations. My at force in the y direction is T1 cosine theta plus T2 sine theta minus the weight equals zero. And T2 equals T1 sine theta, so T1 cosine theta plus T1 sine squared theta over cosine theta. Uh, 
minus the weight equals zero. And I end up with a moderately ugly equation. This tells me that T1 times cosine theta 1 plus tangent squared theta equals W. And I never mem physicists don't memorize equations. You don't like to. We'll rederive it every time. So here, one plus tan squared theta equals secant squared theta. So this is actually equal to T1 over cosine theta. So I get that T1 equals weight cosine theta. And then T2 equals weight sine theta. I got this by plugging this in here. Okay, so what you see here is that then I can, uh, I can take the, um, I can take any problem. In this case, I was considering the net force. There's a lot of problems like this in this chapter where you consider the net forces on a point and you are trying to calculate um, usually the tension um, and you do it by drawing a free body diagram for that particular point where you have some knot. In some of the more complicated problems, you may have multiple knots. And you just start there, write down what you know. You know that it, for, because it is an equilibrium problem, the net force and the net torque have to equal zero. Carefully chug through all of your equations and you will end up solving to get usually the tensions. Sometimes you're solving for other forces. Um, sometimes you can get away with only using the net force or the net torque. Sometimes you have to use both of them. It's gonna depend slightly. You should look at the problem and see if it makes sense that you might have rotations to decide if you are going to need to consider both the net torque and the net force. All right. So ah, this is um, this is the free body diagram for the problem that we just worked through and solved. There's often clever ways that you can do some of the geometry, um, but sometimes it's worth leaving it ugly. You're more if you can get away with it. Sometimes it's worth leaving it ugly because you're more likely to make mistakes and chugging through the the trig. All right, now we have. A torque balance. Okay, so in a torque balance, and by the way, these are some of the most accurate types of scales. So uh, if you ever have to get, you have to ever have to take your weight, actually those old-fashioned looking scales that you see in the doctor's office are often much more accurate. Okay, so this says, so this system is in static equilibrium. So let's say that you knew mass one and mass two, and you want to get mass three. So here we're considering rotations about this point. Now, technically, you could consider rotations about any point, but you'd have to know the force here, and that's a little bit trickier. So if you knew, if you could, let's do it first by considering the, rot the, um, the force here, or the, the rotation about this, and then we'll rework the problem and consider a rotation about the end. So we're going to start with, let me redraw this a little bit. We're going to put our zero here. 
x, y. So positive x will be this direction, negative x will be that direction. All right, so now our torque here, I'm going to be lazy because we've only got motion in, um, we've only got torques in, it can only rotate in one plane, so we don't have to consider uh, all of the, the rotations. We're just going to rotate in one direction. So the torque here, our force is like this. In this case, all of our forces are due to, to gravity only. Let me actually change this. We'll call it weight one, two, and three. Okay, so R cross F is towards me, um, which means that it is that you are looking. I think if I draw it, it works out right. So I think. Okay, R cross F towards me, um, and then. That's going to be in the negative z direction. Let's see. I think actually you will see that. And then it's the opposite of z. So the first one is going to give us 30 centimeters. So we'll write 0.3 meters. Times m3. And that's in the negative z direction, plus 40 centimeters, uh, M2, M3g, 40 centimeters, M2g, and then plus another 70 centimeters, M1g. Notice here I converted to um, meters right away because I like automatic. Now, that's a little confusing because meters and mass. So let's just go ahead and use R1, negative R1, positive R2. I'm sorry, negative R3, positive R2 positive R1. Okay, so that's our net torque. Um, and so you can solve this if you were after M3. That has to equal zero. So M3, we can divide through by a G. And M3 is equal to R1, M1, plus R2, M2, over R3. Okay. We're going to do this another way. Here, we're going to draw our X and Y axis like this. So all I've done is shift the origin. And... Now, I'm going to try to keep the same variables. So, the torque is now, I am just shifting my axis by, so this distance is R3, and this distance is R3. One. So, my torque for mass three about this new axis. Now I have note. I now have another force. So my torque about this axis is R one plus R three m three plus R1 
minus R2, uh, and I need my G, M2, G, and then I need, then it's plus the, nor or minus the normal force, times R1, and that all has to equal zero. So here, considering this axis, it was a little trickier to figure out which, um, what my distances for rotation were. Um, now I also have to consider the net force. So my net force, I'm gonna, it's all gonna be in the y direction. It's now M1 plus M2 plus M3 G minus the normal force, and that is equal to zero. So my normal force is equal to M1 plus M2 plus M3 G. Now I can take this normal force, plug it back in here. And the torque is equal to R, I'm going to write it out the ugly way, R1 M3 G plus R3 M3 G plus R1 M2 G minus R2 M2 G minus M1 R1 G minus M2 R1 G minus M3 R1 G equals zero. Now comes the simplifications. So I have an R1 M1, uh, R1 M3G here, an R1 M3G here. These guys cancel each other out. I have an R1 M2G here and an R1 M2G here. These guys cancel each other out. And now you can see I'm starting to get something that looks a lot like what I had up here. R3M, oh, I didn't mean to switch colors. R3M3G, minus R2, M2, G, minus R, I like minus M1, R1, G equals zero, or M3, I can again cancel out all of my Gs, and M3 equals R, uh, equals R2, M2 plus R1, M1 over R3. Okay, so that was big and long and ugly. But what it showed is that you actually get the same answer whatever pivot point you choose. So I think when you're starting to do this, it can seem like there's some magical choice of pivot point. There's not. You can choose just about anything, but... Some choices are easier than others. So don't freak out and worry that if you don't pick the exact right choice that your answer is not going to work. But do look for something clever so that you can do less work because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. You see that I did it the first way in this little tiny space and I had to use the rest of the space to do it about the other axis. But there's no magic. There's no rotation. So there's no one right answer. There's no rotation. In these equilibrium problems, there's no rotation at all. 
So you don't have to be too, you don't have to worry about being too clever about seeing the right way to do it because there's multiple right ways to do it. Sometimes you should choose the easiest way to write the equations down. And that may be different for each person. But the laws of physics are the same no matter what your coordinate system is. So if you, um, if you set your problem up correctly and you do it correctly, you should get the same answer. And you should get the same answer as your friends as well. OK. So this was then just telling you which, you know, this is a way that you can do it. And this is using the first cho choice where you choose the pivot point to be about the connection with the rod, which is much easier because then you don't have to figure out what the normal force is on that pivot point. But as we showed, it will work either way. Hmm. When I did it just there, I actually assumed that the rod is negligible, um, has a negligible mass. So if you, had a, if you had a rod that does not have negligible mass, you would have to consider the, um, the weight acting on the, uh, causing the weight of the rod itself causing a rotation. OK, and here's another example that you could consider the well, forearm rotating um, because you contract a muscle. Um, you then have, uh, if you're holding a weight, you have a torque about the elbow, um, as well as you, know, you have a moment arm. Um, and you actually have some center of mass for, well, there you have the, the force applied by the bicep, which is at a certain distance from the elbow. It's not exactly there. If the muscle connected exactly at the pivot point, it wouldn't be able to cause a rotation. Um, so you can consider the forces on the, um, on the bones and the forces on the muscle using these skills as well. This is a free body diagram, so this shows that you have forces on the pivot point itself, as well as the force from the mass and the force from the muscle. Um, and you can, of course, choose any possible, um, you can choose to do it in multiple different ways. Okay, here is one of the other classes of problems that you will consider, so you have, uh, that you will see in the chapter you have a ladder leaning against the wall. Now, there's three forces on it. There's the normal force, which acts at the point of contact. There is the weight, which acts at the center. And then there is the force of the wall, which is normal or perpendicular to the wall itself. Um, so here, um, you, oh, and then you have the force of friction. I nearly forgot the force of friction, and the force of friction is very important because if you don't have the force of friction, then you actually will end up getting some rotation. So we'll, choose, we'll use the um, coordinate system drawn right, on, right there. And I'm going to go ahead and write each of our forces. So we will start by writing our, so our forces. Um, that first one is in the negative. So capital F is the magnitude of F in the negative x direction. The uh, weight is equal to the mass of the ladder G. And then it is in the negative y direction. The normal force is in the y, the positive y direction. And friction is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. And this one is in the positive x direction. So this makes the net forces fairly easy to describe. We will start with y. The net force in the y direction is n minus mg 
and that has to equal zero. So we get that the normal force is equal to mg. The force in the x direction is negative capital F, or the normal force um, from the wall, plus mu sub s times the normal force per, from the floor. So this is, now we can just plug this in here, negative F plus mu sub s mg. So we get that, that the magnitude of that force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force with the wall is mu sub s mg. All right, that's from our forces. Now we consider our torques. And here, again, we can choose which pivot point we want, but let's make an easy choice. So what do we want to do? If we choose, if we choose the center of mass, then we don't have to um, we don't have to cons worry about the normal or if we choose the center of mass we don't worry about the weight so then if you choose the center of mass you're looking at rotations this way um, let's let's go ahead and do that let's choose that coordinate system so we're going to put our zero right there of course as we showed a few slides ago that's an arbitrary choice, and as long as you do it correctly, you're going to get the right answer either way. Okay, so the torque is then going to be equal to this moment arm is, the length is L over 2, and it makes an angle beta, so R cross F is, let's see, in the z direction. So pointing at you is the z axis. And that is also going to be the, um, the torque from the normal force. So we have F L over 2. And then cross product has a sine of the angle between them. And this is in the positive z-hat direction. And then the, um, the other one, the, force, the normal force acting on the floor, the torque is going to be in the negative z-direction. So we have n l over 2, another sine beta, let's see, ah, no, this is not sine beta because it's sine pi minus beta, because I need the angle between this moment arm I need this angle, the angle between the moment arm and n. So this is sine of pi minus beta, which we could also write as cosine of beta. OK, and this has to equal 0. So you can ask the question, what is the angle that I, what is the uh, maximum, what is the minimum angle I can put this at to not have it fall? Okay, so then I'm going to replace F with mu sub s mg. Oh, and this had to have a z hat. I, I'm always supposed to have a vector. E I can't write a scalar equals a vector. And this is mgl over 2 cosine beta. This has to equal 0. Um, so now 
I get a lot of cancellations here because I have an MgL over 2 in both of these terms. So mu sub s sine beta equals cosine beta or tan beta equals mu sub s. And that is going to give you the, um, your, that's the shallowest angle that the ladder will sit at without falling. Okay, so a few things to point out. I chose to do the rotation about that axis. I could have chosen that axis. Doesn't much matter. You'll get the same answer either way. I'm not going to do this one both ways because that actually turns out to be a gnarly mess. But I started by setting the net force equal to zero. That let me get the actual magnitudes of the two normal forces in this problem. And then I could calculate the torques. So you see problems like that, where you're having to calculate what the problem, what the question asks you might vary slightly. You might have, um, in that case, you might be asked, okay, the ladder falls when you hit a certain angle. What is the co coefficient of static friction? Um, but the problem would be the same. You get the same equations, and then you're solving at the very end for something slightly different. Okay, this is asking about, so this is a vertical door. So you have a door which is actually hung at two different pivot points. And then um, you can ask the question, what, is the, what are the forces on those, um, those hinges? Given that there is a center of mass, and the center of mass is going to be somewhere around, you know, somewhere around the geometric center, um, and the door has a certain, the, the door will have some mass. You calculate the torques of, about the two different, you know that there's got to be a force, um, which is the, the hinges have to, um, this one pull, pushes up, that one is pulling up um, to keep the door, um, to keep the center of mass from falling. Um, and then you have torques, and you can calculate what the net torques are on those, um, on those two hinges. So what this part does, it goes through a free body diagram. What I want to point out, that you are considering the forces acting at each of the given points, gravity, and then the two hinges. Um, and then you, have, you also have to worry about torques. Okay, now here you have a person standing on a scaffolding. So let's ask the question, what are the forces? We will give this person a mass, M, G, and we're going to ask what the forces are on those two, um, on those two supports. Now, we get to choose where we draw our um, coordinate system. Let's put it at the person right now. You could choose either of the two supports. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's just different approaches. So now we're going to call this R, we will call this distance R1. And this force, this is a tension in the string. We will call this tension one. This one we are going to call R2. Not a very creative name, but there's a time and place for creativity, even in physics, but this is not it. All right, tension two. So now, um, when we consider our force, this one's easy. We only have uh, we have only have forces in the y direction, not in the x direction. So we have negative m g y hat. We're considering the masses of the platform itself as well as of the strings to be negligible, um, and then plus p 
t1y hat plus t2y hat, this all has to equal 0. So t1 plus t2 has to equal mg. Now we consider our torques. The way that I have drawn my x-axis, the z-axis is pointing towards u. Um, and so the negative z is pointing towards me. R cross F is towards U, is positive Z for T1. So we have R1, T1, Z hat. R cross F is towards me. That gives us a negative Z hat. So R2, T2, Z hat equals 0. So then from our torque equation, we have R1, T1 equals R2, T2. And we can get, we end up solving for T1 in terms of T2. We can write T1 equals R2 over R1, T2. Plug this back in here. So you get T2 times 1 plus R2 over R1 equals Mg, or T2 equals Mg over 1 plus R2 over R1. T one, now here, because of the symmetry of the problem, I expect that I should just be able to switch ones and twos and get the same answer, but we're going to show that that's true. All right, so now T1 is equal to R2 over R1 T2. So this is equal to R2 over R1 Mg over 1 plus R2 over R1. So this is equal to mg over r1 over r2 times 1 plus r2 over r1. These guys, be, when they're, you multiply those together, you get 1. So you are left with 1 plus r1 over r2, which is the exact same as this equation, but just switching the 1s and 2s. You should, especially if you're a physics major, start to work on looking for symmetries like that. Which one I called 1 and 2 was totally arbitrary, so I should be able to flip the numbers and get the same, um, the same form of the equation. And then what this says is that, so if you were exactly in the center, uh, then the forces are equal on both of the, um, the tensions in both strings are equal. That, that's good. That's what we naively expect. If you are closer to the one side, let's make R2, uh, so if in this case, the, as drawn, R2 is much smaller than R1. So this number is larger than 1. So this number is larger than, um, larger than 2. And your force is, let's see, R2 is less than R1, so this number is larger than 1, so this number is larger than 2, so this number is smaller than half the mass. That means that, um, that tension 1 is lower if you're closer to one side, and that also sort of intuitively makes sense. If you're right here, then all of the, the tension has to exactly cancel your weight. Now, remember, we could have done this problem with, um, with any given point. We didn't have to pick to consider rotation about the por por point where the person is standing. Any of the possible directions would have worked. We chose the point about the which person. We chose to consider the rotation about the point where the person is standing because why not? It looks pretty. It means I don't have to recalculate R1 and R2. 
um, because we're given those distances. That's maybe why I have a slight preference for rotating about the person, because that's the numbers that we were actually given, so I don't have to recalculate a ton of stuff. But, of course, it's an entirely arbitrary decision. Okay, so now we can consider something like this. Now you have a sign which is hanging ever so, so it's hanging, we've got a tension in this direction. We have a, well, that's the tension not at the sign. Um, you actually have a few points of contact here. So here exactly at the sign you have a tension like this and you have a tension like this. And then you have the weight. And let's see. So we can consider rotations. If you consider, uh, let's see, I think I got, you also would have a ever so slight, um, this is assuming that this is exactly at that point. Um, Ah, you cannot, uh, you don't have that tension as I drew it because this, um, this bar has to actually act up. See, it's got to be pushing, it's got to counteract that force a little bit. So it's going to be pushing the sign out. So I, as I'd drawn it, it was a little off. You actually have to have a tension, you have to have a push in that direction. You can consider rotation of the sign about the, um, let's consider rotation of the sign about this point. Uh, if we did that, then you would have one torque in this direction and one torque in that direction because this, um, this string is going to pull up and the, um, the rod has to make it, the weight's going to make, tend to make it rotate down. You don't have to worry about this tension if you consider this point here because this tension is parallel to the axis of rotation, or sorry, parallel to the moment arm, so it's not going to cause any rotation. Um, you could choose to consider this axis and then you would have, uh, you would have to have, um, you would have to consider the rotation of this one, and you would have to consider the net force at this point along here. Using this, you could calculate the force on this hinge and the force um, here on on the um, on the connection there. You might want to do that if, for instance, you need to build something and you need to know how strong to make the um, the hinge, how strong to make the um, the wire that you're using to hang the sign. Okay, tensile and compressive stress. The so if you have an object which is under which which is under some force, there's there's some tension um, or compression, then the object will actually deform. Uh, so we can quantify how an object will deform. Uh, and you consider, for instance, if you have the object compress or stretch, uh, you have the tensile stress, which is given as the force divided by the area. Um, that's the stress on the object. Um, and, or sorry, that's the strain on the object. Uh, sorry, the stress is the force over the area. And the strain is the change in length divided by the length. So here, you're looking at an object being compressed or stretched. Um, and it will actually um, deform the rod. And you can, and then if you consider, for instance, here you have tensile stress because it's stretching the upper part and compressive stress 
because it's compressing the lower part. If you have a bar which is under, um, which is, which has a lot of weight on it. Um, you can also have bulk stress, which is where the entire object, um, oh, the entire object can be squished um, in response to forces, and we can quantify the um, properties of these. Um, these are properties of different materials. They respond differently. So, so you have, um, in response to stress and strain, you can define something's Young's modulus, which is stress over strain. And that is equal to the force divided by the area divided by the change in length divided by the length. Uh, and that is a property of a material so that um, things that are, that will expand more under this, that are going to expand or compress more under this, they have a larger delta R, delta L over L, are going to have a smaller Young's modulus, and things that do not deform have a larger Young's modulus. And you can also define the bulk modulus, which is the bulk stress over the bulk strain. That's the three-dimensional. Um, that's what's going on in three dimensions. So that is the change in pressure divided by the change in volume over volume. So those are different ways that we quantify how objects move in response to, uh, to forces. So if you have, for instance, um, you have some com compressing force, you're pushing on a piston, it pushes oil up, um, that there's going to be pressure, it pushes the object, and it's going to tend to squish. Um, and it will, uh, you, go, you can actually measure the change in the, uh, in the length of the object that way. Now here, this is shear stress. This is measuring a slightly different concept. This is when you have... Um, you apply a force and you're trying to shear it, so you're trying to get the, so the, um, the two w equal forces in opposite directions, does it rotate or does it retain its shape? And um, you can define the shear modulus as the shear stress over the shear strain and that is the force parallel to the deformation over the area divided by how much it deforms over the length. So these are all properties of different materials. Um, and there are a few exercises in the chapter where you are given you're, you're given the properties of different materials and asked to calculate how they deform, or you are asked to calculate the um, bulk modulus, shear modulus, or, um, or Young's modulus of the different materials. Um, and what you typically see, so there's the stress for um, some type of metal under load, Eventually, as you, you know, most things are linear at first, um, approximately linear, and then at some point you, uh, you know, so here you remove the load, but it's already deformed a little bit, and then um, if you apply more load again, eventually you're going to, so eventually you're going to actually just break the object. At the point that you break object, the object, our equations for the stress and the strain are no longer valid because um, you're not slightly deforming it, you're just breaking it. So now we're going to move on to some examples. 
Uh, here you have different cases. I'll do at least a few of these. Um, so these, these diagrams are a little hard to read. Um, let's go ahead and set up the, um, you're going to do what you, we did before. Uh, you set up the net forces, and I think none of these, you don't need the net torques in any of these. So here you would define T2 and your tension, this is T1, so this is this first exercise, and it's a little bit at an angle I don't like, T1, and the weight, so then um, we will use here this coordinate system. I'll do, the first one's not too bad, so I'm going to go ahead and set it up. Uh, now we have T1 is equal to negative T1 x hat T2 is equal to T, the magnitude of T2 cosine theta, in this case theta is 45 degrees. Um, and let's, that's going to be cosine theta, negative cosine theta, uh, positive cosine theta x hat, and then T2 sine theta y hat. Now in this case, sine theta and x th and cosine theta happen to be equal, but I'm going to leave it as theta. I'm a physicist, that's what I do. I leave stuff as equations until the very last minute. The weight is negative weight um, y hat. <coughs> Calculate the net force in the y direction. I'm going to start with y because it's nice and easy. So weight, is, so we have T2 sine theta minus the weight. That has to equal zero. So from this, I get, let's see, That focus got a little bit off. There we go, and then it was clear. Um, T2 sine theta times the uh, minus the weight equals zero. So we get that T2 is equal to the weight over sine theta. Consider the x direction. We have T2 cosine theta minus T1 equals zero. Now I have T2, so I can, I can say T1 equals T2 cosine theta, so this is equal to the weight times the cotangent of theta. Now, given that I know that sine theta and cosine theta are equal to 1 over the square root of 2, this guy is equal to, T1 is just equal to the weight, and T2 is equal to the weight times the square root of 2. So that's the first one. There's a few different ways that you can do these problems. There are some ways if you, um, you can use geometry. I like to write out force diagrams and do it very meticulously and slowly because I find that I am less likely to make stupid mistakes. And a lot of my physics habits when solving problems are not arranged so much to be quick as much as to avoid stupid mistakes. Because actually I'll be faster if I, don't, if I take my time setting things up and I avoid stupid mistakes. It is very inefficient to have stupid mistakes. Okay, now for the next one I have T1 
and this is T1 in both directions. Um, I'm going to actually call this T3, but it has, well, you are, it is indicated that it's the same, and that's because the, um, the angle between the two wires is the same. We'll actually show that it's the same. So now I have T1, T2, and T3. Okay, T2 is equal, is equal to Mg because I've actually got another force diagram I could write here for the mass, which is the weight and T2. So the T2 has to equal the weight. So now I can write... T2 equals negative mg y hat. T1 is equal to negative T1 cosine theta x hat plus T1 sine theta y hat t3 is the same except now my x component is positive okay now my net force in the x direction. I only have T1 and T3, so I have T1 cosine theta, neg a negative T1 cosine theta, plus T3 cosine theta equals zero. This is how I can get T1 equals T3. I like leaving it general just to make sure that I understand what assumptions I'm making in doing that. All right, Fy is now equal to negative mg plus 2t1 sine theta. Here, I've used the fact that t1 and t2 are equal to each other already. And that's equal to zero. So, t1 equals mg over 2 sine theta. So that sort of makes sense that uh, the shallower, so the um, if I have sine theta equals 0, then I have two vertical, um, two vertical wires supporting the mass, and the tension in each one of them turns out to be the mass divided by 2. That it makes intuitive sense. Um, and then if I have the um, if I have very shallow wires um, so that my angle is almost 90 degrees, or sorry, almost zero degrees, then I end up with a very, very large tension because um, because I have to end up counteracting that mass, and I have very little component which is vertical like this. Okay, so that's the gist of each of these problems. What we what you can do is set up the um, you consider the point where the knot is, draw the free body diagram. And here, I want to do that last one, at least set it up a bit. Because here, you actually have three free body diagrams. And it's a little bit misleading. There are some clever ways to get cancellations so that you don't have to do, um, you don't have to do as much math. But I personally find it harder and trickier to figure out those tricks than to just do it the brute force way. So here, you've got three points um, where you have free body diagrams. And here, this is using the symmetry to say this is T3, 
and this is T3, this is T1, and this is T1. By symmetry, they have to be the same. You could choose to leave them um, different. Now, in our first free body diagram, we have, and this, this is, I will call this T4. Um, our first free body diagram for that point has T4, which is the weight of whatever mass you have, and then you've got T3 and T3. And then, ah, and this one, that's T2. So we will now do this point right here. You've got T1. T2 and T3. Now, you also have the mirror image of this diagram from this point. So you have T2, T1, and T3. Because you've used, ah, that scrolled off the edge, but because you've already used the fact that the, there's symmetry here, this diagram is not going to give you more information, so you could just consider one of them because you've already called these different tensions different things. But you would do the same thing. You're going to write, um, we can do, we can get it started. Uh, the, well, then you would write that the net force is equal to negative weight y hat and then in the y direction you have a cosine of 60 degrees and you have two of them, so you need a factor of two from this one and that one. In the x direction, you have two forces that cancel each other out. So here, you would get that T3 equals the weight over 2 cosine of 60 degrees. And then you consider this diagram, and I'll stop there because the algebra, the geometry is a little bit uglier. Um, you have to watch your angles, make sure you don't make any dumb trig mistakes, which are very easy to make. Um, but either way, what you're doing is that you are Reading it as two separate, um, you, the, each knot gets its own free body diagram. And then you say that the net force is zero. If, you, if it's useful, you can consider a rotation and set the net torque equal to zero. So here, this one is a net torque problem. So here, um, you have a, so this says, when you support this at a point P, it is in equilibrium. Find the magnitude of the force F and the force applied at P. So, let's see. The weight of the structure is negligible. So if you apply a force here, it has got to act in this direction. Okay, so we can um, we can consider a few different things. We we get to choose where we draw our um, 
where we draw our axis, and you want to choose wisely. Um, if we choose this point, it makes, it means that we don't, the force is easy, the net force is easy to calculate. However, the, um, the moment arm here for calculating the torque is a little tricky. If we choose this point, then the net force in the y direction is easy. But then, um, let's see, then we have to consider the, um, the moment arm to that force is an odd angle. So let's go ahead and set our axis here. Anything is going to work, but we want to, but a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So here we're going to set this as our coordinate system. And now uh, the net force on this rod We've got, I'm going to call this F1. This is, we've got to have up or down. Um, we will call this F2. And this one is F3. So now, the net if we do F1 is negative F1 y hat. Why did I call this one y hat? It applied as well. That's X. F2 is going to be, we will just, we're just going to leave that as F2 is un, an unsolved, an unknown. And F3 is equal to the magnitude of F3 x hat. So now our net force, F net, has to equal 0. And that has to equal F1 plus F two plus F three. So F two has to equal the negative of F one plus F three. So that is negative F three X hat plus F one y hat. Okay, now we consider torques and the torque from 1 is r cross f towards u. That's in the positive z direction. So it is r1 f 1 z hat. I'm just going to start with the net torque. And let's see. Only the y component. So here we have a positive y component to F2. So it's going to be a y hat. So a negative x hat cross a y hat is going to be towards me, so that's a negative z. So because the force in the y direction is positive it, and this force is negative, we have to get, uh, we have to have torques in the opposite direction. So R2, F2. This torque, R cross F, is negative z hat. So, the, this force, which is in this direction, 
and that force are going to cause rotation in the same direction. So negative F3 R3. All in the Z hat direction. And that has to equal zero. So find the magnitude of the force um, and the force itself applied at that point. So here, let's see, the magnitude of the force we should get net torque of zero this should give us the same answer that we got before um, I will leave that as an exercise for the student if I recall this problem is actually over constrained it, it turns out to work out correctly because it's a textbook problem um, but you didn't need all of the information that you were given. Okay, so that's the basic idea. You're going to start by, all, as always, drawing your coordinate system on the problem and then doing a free body diagram and starting to write out the net forces and, the, and or the net torques. Um, and here, now you add a different force. The free body diagram is still the same, but you are, um, you are adding a force, um, which if we chose the same pivot point that we did before, this would have no net torque because the moment arm between the pivot, uh, the pivot point and the force is zero. Okay, a uniform seesaw is balanced at its center of mass. Um, the smaller boy, meaning that there's that was the boys are not there, it's perfectly um, it's perfectly balanced. The smaller boy on the right has a mass of 40 kilograms. Well, okay, right and left are totally mixed up since it's mirrored. This guy has mass of of um, ah actually yeah that one's this guy. So, what is the mass of his friend? Okay, so now we're going to draw our axis here. Our, we're going to put our pivot point right at the center. We could have chosen anything, but it's easy if you choose it at the center. So now, here we've got a force in this direction the weight of the first boy. Here we have a force in this direction, the weight of the second boy, and the torque, R cross F, is towards the wall, and that's in the negative Z hat direction. So R1 weight 1, in the negative z hat direction, r cross f points towards u, so that's in the positive z hat direction, r to weight to z hat, and that is equal to zero. So, weight two equals r one weight one over r two, so if weight 1 is 40 kilograms, so we have 4 meters times 40 kilograms divided by 2 meters is 80 kilograms. So same problem solving strategy. Choose your coordinate system. Draw it on your picture. Start drawing the net forces. In this one, we didn't do the net. Uh, we, well, we didn't do the net force because we um, because we didn't have to. If we had chosen a different pivot point, we would need to know the force that acts at that pivot point. 
So we would have needed to use the fact that the net force on the system is zero and write those equations out. We would have then gotten the magnitude of the, of the normal force from the pivot point, which we would have been able to use in order to, um, in order to calculate the uh, net torque about any other point. All right, a uniform plank rests on a level surface as shown below. The plank has a, ma <coughs> has a mass of 30 kilograms and is six meters long. How much mass can be placed at its right end before it tips? Um, okay, so then, um, and it hint, when the board is about to tip over, it makes contact with the surface only along the edge that becomes a momentary axis of rotation. Um, okay, so that is pointing you to use the pivot point. Now here it actually does matter um, which you use as your um, pivot point, so where you set your coordinate system, because in many systems you will not get, it, it's not possible to get any rotation. So we're going to use X and Y. Now if we try to figure out, so it's uniform, and it is a six meter long board, so its center of mass is going to be at three meters from the end, or 1.2 meters. I'll try to draw it about here. So here is your is the center of mass, and that's 1.2 negative 1.2 meters in the x direction the way that we have drawn it. And then we're putting some mass M right there at 1.8 meters. Uh, the net force doesn't matter so much because you would have a normal force acting against here as long unless you cause a rotation. So at the point that you cause rotation, the normal force goes uh, the, the board starts tipping and you don't end up with a normal force. It's, so because we're considering rotation about this point, we don't need to consider the normal force. So let's write our net torque. Our net torque is, this is R, this is F, because I've got my weight acting in that direction, that is in the negative z direction. So I have R mass mg in the negative z direction. And I have called this R sub mass. And then here I have another weight this is the weight from the mass. This is the weight from the center of mass. R cross F is towards U, or the positive Z hat direction. So now I have R center of mass, M center of mass, G in the positive Z hat direction. And this all has to equal zero. Boom, boom, and this is asking how much mass can be placed at the end. Mass, the, the mass that I can place, that lowercase m, is equal to R center of mass times the mass of the board divided by R of the mass. So, the position of the center of mass, is the magnitude of that is 1.2 divided by 1.8, or 2 thirds, times 30 kilograms. 2 thirds times 30 is 20, so we have 20 kilograms. You can put a 20 kilogram mass at the end. Uh, 
All right. So same procedure. What you're doing is that you are drawing an axis, calculating the net force and the net torque, or choosing a clever option so you don't have to do as much. The worst case scenario, if you'd not chosen wisely, is you would have worked a little harder. Uh, similar problem, now you have two boys. If they are exactly evenly matched, given the weight of one, calculate the other. We're going to choose to put the x-axis at equal to zero right there. M1, M2. So this is becoming old hat. R cross F is my force. I meant to make this one one. R cross F toward the board. R cross F towards you. So negative R1 M1 G Z hat plus R2 M2 G Z hat equals zero. So given this, I can say R2 M2 equals R1 M1. I can either be, um, so I'm given the, the positions Given one, the mass of one boy, I can get the other. You should be able to do that in your sleep by the time that you get to the exam. Hopefully you're not actually sleeping in the exam. It's not a good strategy. Same basic procedure. Look at your picture. Look at your problem. Draw a picture. Draw an axis label on it. All right. Now... This question is what happens to the, this is asking about what happens to the tension in the string. Um, what is the force of the rope on the car? All right. Now, what you would do is this is a tension, so actually, we can think about the point right there um, where you're pulling. There is a tension here, and there is a tension here. If this is 0.3 meters and this is 15 meters, then this is 7.5 meters and 0.3 meters, so you have theta where tan theta is equal to 0.3 over 7. Oh, that doesn't, can't read that at all. Tan theta equals 0.3 over 7.5, a very small number. So you're pulling a little bit at a, um, you're pulling the string at a slight angle. This is the tension in the string, um, and it's going to be the, the same tension in both directions. So the tension in the string is then going to be, uh, you have, we call this T1 and this T2. We will see that you end up with the same tension. But I at least think it's nice to have different variable names for each of your tension. So now you have T1 equals cosine t1 cosine theta if theta is equal to zero we need this to be all in the x direction so this is x hat 
and it's in the negative x hat direction. plus P1 sine theta in the y hat direction. P2 is the same except that the sine of the x direction is flipped because the, um, because the tension is going in the opposite direction. And force is that you're applying is in the y direction. So now in the x direction you get t2 cosine theta minus t1 cosine theta equals zero. This gives you t1 equals t2. In the y direction you get now so now we can use T1 equals T2, so 2T1 two sine theta. Um, ah, these were in the negative y direction because they have to be the opposite direction of the applied force. So negative 2 T2 two sine theta plus force equals 0. So the tension in the string is equal to the force divided by 2 sine theta. So a very small, um, a very small angle is going to lead to a very large um, tension in the string. Could very well pull your bumper off. Don't do this unless you know what you're doing. Your physics textbook is not a guide to life. Sometimes it, well, sometimes it can tell you why the things that you might want to do are stupid. Or foolish, I should say. So, say, notice that we followed the same basic protocol where we drew a picture, drew our coordinate system, started writing down our forces, broke them into components, wrote the net force or, and or the net torque, depending on how to solve the problem best. All right, we did an example similar to this earlier on. We'll go ahead and set it up again. Two cables. Now you have, I'm going to call this guy M, this one little m. Now we have, let's see, how do we want to set up our coordinate system? We will choose this. I think we did it at the center last time. Now it matters less. X, Y, this is T1, this is T2. We have the weight of mass M and mass capital M. This is an annoying thing that physics books do. We like to use capital and lowercase, and it can make it really tricky to follow what's going on. Bear with me. All right. I didn't draw my coordinate system. Ah, uh, yeah, I did. I drew it at the corner. So for the force, the coordinate system, choice of coordinate system does not matter. Um, we are going for our net force on this object, we are ignoring um, we are ignoring the weight of uh, this says this has the scaffold, so we will draw the weight of the scaffold. So that's m sub s, and we're going to put it right at the center. So now our net force is going to be all in the y direction. So I'll just make force in the y direction because there's no force in the x direction is T1 plus T2 minus capital M plus the mass of the scaffold plus the mass of the bucket G equals zero. So we get that the sum of the tensions 
has to equal the sum of the weights. We sort of knew that. Okay, now the torques. About this point, this tension doesn't apply any torque because the moment arm is zero. And then we have the weights are all gonna have direction R cross F, which is in the negative Z hat direction. And the tension has a positive Z hat direction. So we have the length of the scaffold T2 in the positive Z hat direction minus the position of mass M, capital mass M G minus the position of uh, the, let's see, the position of the scaffold is L over two times the mass of the scaffold G minus, ah, let me delete my Z hat and put a big parentheses around at the end minus position of the paint can, mass of the paint can, G. Big parentheses, let me do, 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 do. this one. I'm moving things so that I can fit everything in. This is all in the Z hat direction. Okay, so that torque has to equal zero. And I have no contribution from T1. That does tell me that I can, well, that tells me that I can, I know once I have T2, I can get T1. If this is all equal to zero, this makes it really easy to solve for T2. T2 is equal to the position of the painter over the length times the mass of the painter plus the mass of the scaffold plus the position of the paint can over the length times the mass of the paint can all times G. And then T1 would just be whatever that the total mass, um, the total weight minus T2. Check your units. This is a unitless quantity times mg. So that gives us the correct units for force. Um, I won't plug in the numbers. That tells you that, that tells you how to do it. Note that you could have chosen the center of the scaffold, which would mean that you would not have to consider the, um, the torque due to the, um, due to the paint can, um, or sorry, you wouldn't have to consider the torque due to the center of mass of the scaffold. Um, it would have eliminated one term. Uh, on the other hand, you would have had to, it would have been more tricky to solve separately for, the, for both tensions at once. Pros and cons of each approach. If you're not sure which to choose, don't worry about it too much because as long as you're careful with your algebra, and that's a big if, that's the number one problem people have in intro physics classes, as long as you're careful with your algebra, you'll get the right answer anyways. All right, a uniform trap door shown below is has certain dimensions. It's supported by a hinge um, and a, a light rope tied between the middle of the door and the floor. The door is held at the positions shown where its slab makes an angle with the floor. Um, find the tension in the rope and the force at the hinge. Okay, so how you would do this is that you are going to model the, um, you're going to model the door as a point particle located exactly at its center. Um, and then there's a um, you can you have a torque about the hinge. So I would put my coordinate system at exactly at the hinge, um, and then you have a tension applied there. Um, and 
you would follow the same procedure. You're going to draw a free body diagram. Um, you have the mass here and the tension acting in that direction. Um, and that's going to make a slight angle with the, um, with the hinge itself. So if you draw here, let's see, I think you're given, so here you have the distance between the rope and the hinge. You are given that this is 20 degrees um, and the rope is connected in the middle of the door, so this is at 0.75 meters. Um, so this is a little bit uglier trigonometry um, to figure out what each of these lengths are. Um, and the relevant angle for the torque, um, so your moment arm is here because the force is applied here. And then you have some angle that that torque, um, that that tension makes with the, um, with the moment arm. So the geometry is a little uglier, but the principle is the same. You have a net, you have to work out what the directions are, the uni then you have a net torque, and the net torque is zero. And with that, we're going to stop this chapter, and I'll see you for the next chapter.